He's been hit. I've been hit. The right reminded us we were not free men. Around this time, I heard that some of the men had built a tunnel out of the camp. What the hell? Apparently, it started in bunkhouse one in the second class yard. What? Yeah, my family in Ukraine had tunnels in northern Ukraine. They used to hide from Russians there. Though how anyone even attempted such a thing under constant guard is a mystery. The door was hidden under a small seaman's chest. What the hell? Beneath the chest, there was a trap drawer. Jesus Christ! It's like, who is Kaiser Soze, motherfucker? <laughs> The tunnel led to another bunkhouse holding first-class prisoners. From there, they were digging toward the court, quartermaster's store where the arms ammunition was kept. What the fuck? Well, a lot of them were part Northern Irish too, right? From the from the Crimean War. That's not an excuse. That's just insane. Well, why not? Built with a sump for drainage and ventilated by lateral air shafts, it must have been something to see. They put in lateral air shafts? Yeah, sure, why not? They know how to build tunnels and they know how to put in air shafts. Um, stuff for drainage too? Were they going to live there? Imagine those men toiling away to build it. Well, yeah, if they got stuck inside for a while while they're fighting the guards, you know, they have to be able to air and, and pee and all that stuff. Breathe air and pee. Hour by hour, night by night, slaving away underground. Jesus Christ, like he's building a fucking subway. I had to wonder, did these manage... Did they manage to steal some tools or did they have to do it all by hand? Jesus Christ. What would they have done if they had gotten those rifles? Oh yeah, what? <laughs> where did they think they could escape to? Yeah, where? Ontario? <laughs> Maybe they could go hide out in a residential school. Shut up! <laughs> How long would they have lasted in the wilderness? Oh, that's actually a good question and all to be discovered by the camp guards oh shit boy jig is up I pity the poor devils who got caught they were forced to fill it back in burying their hopes along their tunnel but I suppose all of us were buried alive in our own way holy shit we continued to fight back against the injustice of our captivity. The second half of August, it was the Feast of the Virgin Mary. We want some time to celebrate. We'll see. Back to work. When we didn't hear back, we decided we simply wouldn't go to work that day. We were going to celebrate. Internees, get to work. Today is a holiday. We won't work. A short while later, a few dozen shoulders, soldiers arrived to deal with us. We were put into two rows and forced to march. That's shady shit. Yeah, that's shady shit. At lunchtime, we were allowed to sit. There was no food or water. Jesus Christ. So they wouldn't work, so they made them work harder that day. Yep. But we decided that the officers weren't going to stop us from celebrating. Singing. Look at the notes. There's notes. They're singing. The soldiers laughed at our singing. You're better off praying to the commandment. He's the only one that can help you. We were forced to march until 6 p.m. When we came back to the barracks, there was bread and jam and tea waiting for us. Well, that was nice of them. That was how we observed the Feast of the Virgin Mary in 1916. There was also some relief at Christmas, at least for the Ukrainians. Many of us received parcels with fruit and tobacco from those on the outside. The war continued and even more workers were needed. The authorities in Ottawa knew that we could be very useful to them. The commandment brought in a man who had been interned with us to try to convince us to accept parole and work. It's not so bad. They pay you. We attacked him as he talked to us. Yeah, get him, traitor. Get out of here. It wasn't for the soldiers we would have lynched him. Jesus Christ, that's vicious shit. Yeah, well, it was vicious shit. He's trying to talk them into, like, you know, working for them for nothing. 
He left with what he had arrived with. Nothing. We worked and dreamed until April of 1917. Add attention. Get up, boys. No! Shh, Lama, don't get them into trouble. On April 2nd, officers came into our barracks. Those who were inspected were taken to the train. Where do you think you're going now? They're getting deported. They're they're getting deported by train to uh, from Ontario to Sydney, Nova Scotia. We arrived in Sydney, Nova Scotia on Good Friday. Get off the train. We were divided into three groups. That just looks like it sucks. One group was sent to the mines in Glass Bay. Looks like it sucks. A second group stayed put in Sydney. This fucking sucks, man. My group was near Whitney Pier. That just sucks. As soon as we were dropped off, we were approached by a man. It's Ukrainian. My name is Fedora. I'm also Ukrainian. I work for Dominion Steel and Coal Corporation. Snitch! This is the superintendent and vice superintendent of the foundry you'll be working in. No. We want to go home. Nick Federer... Federoritz, who had emerged as one of our leaders back in Kapiskasing, spoke up. No, we want to go home. A company brought you here to work, so you're going to work. So we don't want to work for that fucking tool. Well, he's going to tool them if they don't, they don't do what the tool says. We give you a minute to cool off, but we'll be back. We were in the middle of nowhere with no money, no food, and we were getting cold and wet. What are we going to do? I'm not sure, but I know we're not going with them. Around 2 p.m., three men returned. Well, what have you decided? We're not going with you. Send us back to Kapiskasing if you must. Dude, that dude looks evil, man. Yo, he's got a fedora. You will come with us. How about you give us a bit more time to think about it? Send us back to Kapiskasing if you must. You read that part already. In the meantime, you can wait here. I don't trust it, man. I can't trust this shit. I don't think you can trust it either. The next time the men came back, they brought the police with them. Who is your leader? We don't have one. We have made this decision together. Don't touch him. Don't move. Shit, they got the guns out fast. Yeah, they like their guns. Hey, where are you taking him? Calm down. We won't hurt him. We just want to talk. Yeah, I bet they do. Looks like they want to talk with guns. A few minutes later. Jesus, shit. They did that in a few minutes? What did they use? Their guns? Probably. Okay, boys. It's okay, boys. Let's go with them. Jesus Christ, they broke them, man. That's that's what they do. They break you. That night, we slept on a train in Sydney. At least they brought us fish sandwiches and tea. Early the next morning, they put us on two streetcars and took us back to Whitney Pier. There was a foundry here where we were told we were going to work. When we were loaded off the train, Fedora approached us. No, Fedora, fuck off. Go away, crook. Hold on. What's going to happen to us? Come with me now. I'll show you where you're going to live. You're going to work. Now, come on. Let me show you where you'll sleep. This guy sucks. He tells them what to eat, where to sleep, where to work. How much money do they make? Like, sweet fuck all. We told you yesterday we didn't come here to work. Take us back to Kappa's casing or let us go. Police! Snitch! Rat! Oh shit, here we go. Here we go. Like wild animals, they fell upon us and beat us with clubs, many men from their elbows. Soon enough, the police had herded us together. Enough! You will work. Once again, it seemed like we had no choice. It's because they had no choice. 
I was put in an old wooden house with nine other Ukrainians and Poles. To celebrate Easter, we decided to dye some eggs together. Oh, shit, remember doing that when you were five and you burned your hand? It was really hard. That wax is, like, really difficult, but it's so much fun and they're so pretty. I don't read Ukrainian anymore or Russian, so I can't, I can't, I can't remember how to make this, how to read Cyrillic and make out the sounds. Once upon a time I could, but right now I can't. Um, it was a bloody Easter, but it ended well. Christ has risen. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Come on. Jesus, Jesus. We should have a Jesus moment. On Monday, Fedora came to get us. No foundry today. You're going to the Marble Mountain to mine stone. Marble Mountain was a small settlement with two stores, a church and a doctor, who doubled as a dentist. There were a few dozen residents, all of whom depended on the mine for their livelihood. The work was hard, but we survived. He's breaking rocks. Yep. We did this work until December when the ground froze. It was then sent, I was then sent back to the foundry in Whitney Pier. This work wasn't as hard, but it was dangerous. Almost every day someone was injured. One man even died. I worked here until the end of the war in November of 1918. The war is over. I want to go home. That's not allowed. Back to work. What the fuck? Who gives him the right? He's with the police he's with the military he can do what he wants after everything we had been through we desperately wanted our freedom we decided to escape no don't do it it's a trap early the next morning we took each um early the next morning we each took what we had and hit the road several of us went to the train station in the hope of catching a train one ticket to montreal please Sure, but the next train doesn't leave for a while. You're welcome to come wait here. The guy looks hinky, man. Bam, bam, bam. We were so tired that we didn't realize that the man had recognized us and called Fedora. What a bastard, you fucking tool. Shut up. Get off the phone. Blah, 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 blah. Baseball bats don't make pop up sense. But before we knew what was happening, five armed thugs grabbed us. Is he kicking him out of the car or throwing him in? I think they're throwing him in, but it looks like he's flying out. <clears throat> they brought us back to the foundry where the slave trade and turnies continued. Wait a second, turn that back again? What? Go back one page. Shit, I just lost it. Let me see if I can get it. I don't know. There it is. What, that one? They were there? Yeah. Isn't that what it used to look like when, like, hookers would get thrown out of cars in Parkdale in the 90s? Um, yeah, that used to be a thing. People would throw hookers out, out on the road of speeding cars. That was disgusting. So they threw these men into the, like, the paddy wagon, like hookers. Yeah. I guess. They brought us back to the foundry where the slave trade with internees continued. They implemented a system that made sure we could never leave. If we wanted to go anywhere, we had to get permits. They were expensive, anywhere from 25 to to $100. Jesus Christ, they had to get a permit to leave? If you tried to leave without a permit, you were arrested and sent to Strait of Canso by boat. What the fuck? How much money did they make? I don't know. They also collected an annual tax of $10. If you didn't have this money, you were arrested and had to do time in jail, all without a day in court. Jesus Christ. We never knew what the tax was for since they weren't even sidewalks. There weren't even sidewalks. All of this meant that we had remained in Sydney long after the war had ended. How can they do that by law? They can do what they want. They're the government. Things weren't all bad. Join the union. In 1922, there were attempts to organize a union for everyone in the foundry and the mines. It's back when unions were cool. Yeah. <laughs> At this time, there was only a craft union for the highly skilled metal workers. The rest of us weren't organized. So when we would go on strike, scabs would just replace us. What's a scab? There's a really good Bernie Mac episode about what a scab is. 
they're they're people who will work for cheaper. Are you freaking kidding me? Yeah, pretty much anyone do it. I'll scab my crochet any day. But you don't work like these people. No, I don't. United we stand, united we win. We decided that we had to organize everyone into one big union. We became District 26 of United Mine Workers of America. Our local was based at a progressive lodge in town. We grew so much that we took over the second floor. Jesus Christ. The Mine Workers of America. But they're in Nova Scotia. Well, you know, it's on the border. Ish. We even organized a Ukrainian caucus. <laughs> did you say caucus? I did. Just just relax, Lama. It's okay. This is a PG book. We held our meetings on the basement of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. The leaders of our caucus were D. Medenzik. Medenzik. Medin. Medinskis. S. Firlet. F. Balan. S. Fedun. S. Kowals. Sitch, Kowalskich, and myself. You did a great job pronouncing those names. You're just like natural Ukrainian. I know. I'm out of practice. Things were fine for a while, but then in January of 1923, three workers were fired. A protest strike was declared. Two game on, buddy. A few scabs and the foremen remained in the factory, but they were useless. They couldn't even keep going, keep the fire going to keep the pipes from freezing without us. That's nasty. They were also too scared to come outside. So the company ordered a boxcar to bring in food, tobacco, and beds for them to sleep in. On strike. On strike. When a box park got close to the gate, we'd stop it for inspection. What the fuck? Who are these people? The IRA? The Ukrainians. One time, it wasn't just food and beds in there. The fedora, what the fuck is he doing in there? Sneak, man. That's what he does all day. He just micromanages these guys. To make sure he didn't come back, we escorted him home. He was yelled at the whole way. Scab, traitor. Oh, shit. They're just fucking up fedora now. Yeah, why not? They're Ukrainians. A second strike was called in June for better working conditions and the recognition for a union. The A's have it. It's a strike. For over four weeks, we were in control. Neither the company, police, nor army gave us any trouble. You're not just hurting us, but also yourselves. Better conditions benefit us all. Where have I heard that before? Shit. It's like drummed in my subconscious. <laughs> we even managed to convince a few people not to scab. This all changed one Sunday in July out of nowhere. The provincial police attacked us. What, they got fucked up by the OPP? OPP, yeah, you know me. They even attacked a group of people leaving church who had nothing to do with us. What the fuck? Why would they do that? Just so people wouldn't get close to the movement. It's a divide and conquer strategy. The tide had turned against us. The police began escorting scabs into the building. Money in the bank was running out, and the government announced the strike that had been called illegally. A meeting was called, and we decided to go back to work. Let's face it, boys, we're finished. Come back. Coming back was not easy. Vodora knew us all well and put many on the blacklist. What a fucking Fedora! I learned that Furlet and Balan no longer worked at the foundry. Balan went to the States and Furlet to the Soviet Union. Holy shit, he fucked off back to the Soviet Union. Yeah. I also left the foundry because I learned from a reliable source that my name was on the blacklist too. What the fuck? At that time, the harvest was beginning in Western Canada, so I ended up in Winnipeg. He ended up on a fucking blacklist because he just wanted to get paid like a regular wage? Yep. So he asked for his rights and he got blacklisted? Yep. Doesn't take much. So, do you think things have changed much? Well, working conditions have changed. I don't know. We still have... I don't know. Actually, I'm going to maybe not answer that. You want, you want the right to not uh, to plead the fifth? There you go. Um, in the summer of 1945, I went back to visit Kapuskasing. Near the river 
where in 1916 there was nothing but forest, there was now a large hotel built by the owner of the Spruce Falls Power and Paper Company. When I got off the train, I couldn't believe my eyes. There was also a nice hospital, several schools, and a post office. On the island where I was hauled for insubordination, there was now a modern powerhouse that supplied electricity to the paper mill. Horses were grazing where the barracks once stood. This sounds like a fucking nightmare. It's very surreal when you think about it. Very surreal. Um, hold on, Lana. Let me right here. Hello. Further west, I saw rows sown with various plants. I learned that this was now an experimental farm run by the government. No shit. In the big barn that the internities, the internees had built 30 years before, I saw chickens, horses, and cattle. That would be creepy. And there was nothing there. Yep. I also stopped on the bridge before town. The people who live here now don't see Kappa's gazing the way I do. In front of me is a picture from 30 years ago where Ukrainians at the point of bayonets fed on sauerkraut and rotten liver cleared hundreds of acres of forest and made a wasteland fertile. Through the doors came agents from various companies and contractors who promised to save me from deportation if I worked for them. I remember when I arrived in Canada in 1912. They put me in an immigration shed, and I wouldn't be let out until I paid the $25. Since I didn't have the money, they told me they were going to deport me. Wait, that part came first. Yes, it did. Through the doors came the agents from various companies and contractors who promised me to save me from deportation if I worked for them. Because of this, many Ukrainians ended up working for railroad companies, breaking rock with primitive equipment. Others worked for Dominion Steel and Coal Corporation. When I was in Sydney, I met people who had been taken from the immigration sheds to work for nine cents an hour. Those who were given parcels of land in Western Canada fared a little better. The work was arduous and rarely rewarding. Then in 1930, trust companies claimed it all as their own. Tens of thousands of Ukrainians ended up on the street. Many former farmers moved into industrial cities and joined the growing number of unemployed. Is this during the Depression? Yep. Many traveled across Canada looking for work. In 1940, I went to Sudbury because the International Nickel Company was promising its workers $6 for an eight-hour day. I stood outside the hiring office for days. It was all a scam. Only one uh, out of 100 got a job. The rest of us had to sell the clothes off our backs to buy some bread. Oh, shit, that sucks. This is Western democracy. This is the reality of Canada for enemy aliens like me. My last stop was to the cemetery. While I was paying my respects, a car pulled beside me. What are you doing here? Visiting some friends I used to work with here. Oh, really? I've lived here a long time and I've never seen anyone come to this cemetery. He was right. Most visitors went to Kapskasing's other cemetery. Where the grass was cut, there are tombstones. There are nice flowers and the tombstones are well maintained. Here, the men who cleared the forest lay forgotten by the world, as if they were made by another god. But I had not forgotten them. As I walked back into town, I remembered what all of us attorneys promised each other in the camp. We were going to tell the world about how we were tortured, and it would become a part of history.